Hello and welcome to episode 59 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host Mark, and coming up on today's episode is a huge guest. For me personally, it's absolutely massive. It's groundbreaking. It's astonishing. It's the director and the writer of the film Mac and Me, Stuart Raphael. So for me today, knowing this podcast is called Mark and Me after the film Mac and Me, my logo is the actual alien Mac from Mac and Me, and I'm now joined by the guy that wrote it and directed it. Yeah, I'm pretty thrilled to say the least. So that's today's episode. But let's just touch base about the last episode. So I was joined by Chris from the band Can't Swim. And this was a great episode, really short and snappy, really full of life and just really good energy. And a lot of people jumped on board and then checked out the band. And that's the ultimate compliment. Like when I had Tracy on recently talking about her book Searching for Candy and then people went and ordered the book. That's the ultimate compliment. If you didn't know about it, you have then tuned into the podcast, found out about it and invested your money. That is huge. That means my work here is done. So to know people then went and checked out the band Can't Swim and loved them or bought tickets to their UK tour is the ultimate. So thank you very, very much for all of you tuning in and then checking out the band. But let's get to today's episode. As I said, I'm joined by the writer and director of Mac and Me. So let's get straight to it. Here's me and Stuart Raphael. Okay, so Stuart, thanks for joining me today on the Mark and Me podcast. My pleasure. My first question for you is, when you were growing up as a kid, what was it that you actually wanted to be when you were older? Was it a film director? Was it a film star? Or was it something completely different? Well, I always loved movies because they took you around the world. So I liked all the the outside adventure films in general. I used to sneak into the theatres and not pay. It was pretty diabolical, but that was the way it was after the war. So I always loved movies, but I actually grew up on my uncle's farm, and I was kind of an outdoorsy person myself. The irony was I started off wanting to be a jockey, and then I grew to be six feet, six and a half inches tall. So it's a bit big to be a jockey. In fact, the horse always looked like a centipede with me on it. And um, that's why I used to go to the horse sales in England, because I used to you know, buy horses and train them for the point-to-points and things. So where about in the UK were you from? From just outside of Coventry. Oh, lovely. What was it that made your family all move back over to America? Only me came. Was it just you? Yeah, yeah. So what age were you when you went over to America? 18 when I got on the Queen Mary. Wow. And what was the main reason that you decided to take that jump? Always wanted to get out where there was more space, more nature, more sun. Have you ever come back or have you just stayed there the whole time? No, I come back and visit my mother and my sister still lives there, so I love England. And so I like to come, but only in the summer. So at the age of 18, when you went over to America, is that when you decided you wanted to study film and get into being a director? No, I came here, worked on a farm in Minnesota. When you came here, you had to have a job in the old days. And you had to have a job that wasn't taking a job off an American. So I went to work on a farm in Minnesota, which was pretty bleak in the middle of February. Uh, And after three weeks, not getting on particularly well with the the people I was staying with, I caught a bus and went to California. And after several weeks, just, just doing bit jobs, I got a job on a wild animal ranch, which supplied wild animals to companies in the film business. And I used to do stunt work with the animals and within... Six months of being here, I was on my way to Africa to do a film with Bill Holden and Trevor Howard. Um, So I took three lions to Africa to do a film. Then I had the business, I started my own company doing that, training animals for the films, which meant I was on a film set virtually every day. And uh, I just observed what was happening. And after about two years, I'd saved enough money. I said, well, I'll make my own movie. And I made the kids' movie and sold it to Warners. What was the first film that you made? It was called The Tender Warrior. It was about a swamp boy living in the swamps and having his altercations with some poachers and hooch makers in those days. So after that, I quickly graduated up into doing other things, and that was it. At what point was it that you thought, I can make a career out of this? Because obviously you were training those animals, which is completely different. You'd done two years, you'd got experience, you'd learnt the trade. 
But at what point was it you thought, actually, I can do this as a full-time career? You know, when you're that young and you've just gone to a, a new country, you just do what you can and you don't really think about organizing your life that well. You have to be fluid and uh, you just take advantage of what comes along. And it was a good time in America because it was the 60s, the early 60s, and it was, uh, you know, there's not a lot of people in California the movie business was exotic and fun and I just found it to be the best business in the world to be in because the main thing is making films is an adventure, particularly if you do outdoorsy kind of films, which I did a lot of to start with. And I love the travel, I love the nature, I love the what the wildlife that I had in the animal in the in the films with the animals and everything. It was great. So you didn't actually go to film school and learn it um, professionally? Never had any um, instruction whatsoever. So it was just basically learning from people that were around you? Well, just observing it and, you know, the most important thing in film is to learn how to edit. Editing tells you how much you need to cut together to accomplish the f the finished film. And um, so that's the most important thing to learn about films is the editing as far as the structure of that art form so around that age when you were making your first film what were your kind of influences did you have any favorite films or directors not really i like i still like the big westerns and the outdoors things i had no idea of film history i had no <clears throat> connection to the art as far as studying different styles or different directors approaches or anything i just pretty well made movies about what interested me and that's what i did and that's how we made a living so obviously one of your biggest films is mac and me how did this come about because you didn't just direct it you wrote it as well didn't you well what happened is i was i got a call from rj lewis who was the <laughs> producer and he said I, i'm doing a movie i want you to direct it and i said well what's the what, well, fine, well, what's the story? And then he had a, an idea to do this movie about this space alien, which was obviously derivative of um, <clears throat> uh, the Spielberg film. And um, But he didn't have it written down or anything. And uh, But he'd hired a whole crew. He was a quite a f well known. I, I still see him near my house. He'd, we go to the same restaurant. And he had a a rich career um, producing films. He did a lot of the Ocean's Eleven films and he did um, uh, The Karate Kid and all those sorts of films. You know, he worked with one big producer and then, but he was the line producer. So he had a crew and he had the crew on the payroll and he had a big, huge office and he had raised the money to do the film from one of the people that, supplied mcdonald's with the produce they have right and he want he wanted the film to be made so that um the profits of the film would go to the ronald mcdonald charity which is a charity they have connected to mcdonald's helping people that are ill have places to stay near the hospitals where the parents can stay so it was a good worthwhile thing he'd already hired an ad a cameraman a um a composer, Alan Silvestri of all people, who was a wonderful, wonderful composer. And um, he hired the production crew, basically. So I just would go down there and I imagine what the film would be and set about getting things made. I had to get the alien made first. So we, we did sketches and all this stuff, and then eventually we did models. And... Um, then we made the, the, the creature and everything. As I was doing that, when the weekends came, I would go and lock myself in a hotel room and write the script and then come back and give the pages I had to the crew so they knew what they had to provide, and that's the way it went. So when you actually met with this producer and he had all this amazing, you know, everything down, which is not the normal way of proceeding is it absolutely you know? not because they're all sitting on their butts and doing nothing because they didn't have a, a, a script and they didn't have a director and um he had them all on the payroll which was ludicrous but he had that crew he wanted that crew he was scared of losing that crew so that's how this came about so when you were presented with this idea and this alien and everything before you started making this alien 
How involved were you in actually writing the story and the script and getting involved, or was that all done for you as well? No, I did all that. Wow. He told me what he wanted, mm. and I just made it up as I, from that point on. He told me what he wanted, and he was pretty explicit about that. And uh, then I wrote it, and that was what we made, basically. I mean, I made some changes to please him and to put things in there that suited the investor that was in connected to McDonald's, you know, a, a, a scene in the McDonald's um, restaurant, a dance number and things like that. And how was it then when you were writing? Were you trying to not take influence from stuff like E.T. and stuff? Were you sitting there thinking you wanted to try and break away so people didn't associate it with that? I didn't, you know, I never, I, I hadn't, I'd only seen E.T. once and it was just a, a, another film in my mind. It was, I mean, let's face it, all alien movies are basically the same. All westerns are basically the same in their essence, you understand? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to do a thing with an alien, you're going to have an alien. You can't avoid that issue. And consequently, um, there was one caveat that I had to deal with, and that is that the producer, and this is, I think, very commendable on his behalf, he wanted to do a movie with a child that was handicapped. Yeah. He wanted the star not only to be a child, but he wanted it to be a handicapped child. And... Um, so we in the casting we'd found this kid that was you know had spinal spinal abifita and was you know lived in a wheelchair and he was adorable and we went with him so that was that added another difficult element to work with when you were doing the movie so when you wrote the action scenes you had to write things that would take advantage of locations where he could be in a wheelchair basically and you said that you were helping design the actual alien concept as well. You were drawing and had these ideas. Where did you, you take? Where did you take influence from that? Because it's a very unique looking alien, especially the mouth and the eyes. It's a. It doesn't look like anything else. It's just you know, you, it's all artist experimentation. They start doing it, and of course, the eyes are really the most important thing. And um, it's incredible how realistic they can make eyeballs because they've had practice making fake eyes for humans so they made you know they they give you a book with all the different glass eyes you can put into these creatures and i thought that was the most inspiring thing for me when i saw how great that was and the one thing we we discovered is that when you have glass eyes you want to put a, an imperfection in them you don't want to make them absolutely perfect in their rendition you want to have a little different something is a little bit off here and there which is the case with real eyes and which people that did eyes told me about it was one of the things we learned from replacement people that do that if mac and me was made now you know that the production and the, the studio would make him completely cgi absolutely what i think makes mac and me so special is the fact that now when you look back, it doesn't look as aged because it was done with practical effects, which I think is classic. That's stuff like John Carpenter's The Thing and stuff. Now, with this alien design and the parents and everything else, was that something that you had to put a lot of thought into because obviously you didn't have the use of CGI to make him look... Absolutely. As Everything is, can, is built around the limitations of the puppet. Yeah. By the way, I did a picture with John Carpenter. I didn't do a picture with him... I took over a film that he was doing, um, what was it called? The Philadelphia Experiment. Wow. And he he had been one of the writers. There were like 16 writers on it over time. Then I came in on it. And um, and then I did a rewrite on it, but I'd never even challenged the credit because I, I actually rewrote that thing just before I made it. I walked off that film and um, because the script was so bad, and then the, the head of the studio said, well, what did you want? I told him. He says, well, just do that. And I actually made a movie with no prep at all because the screenplay was written as we were making it, basically. Wow. And you still pulled uh, it off. The limitations on the, the, the puppet itself are considerable. The facial expressions were reasonably good, and the arm movements were reasonable, but it was just a puppet. He didn't, he couldn't walk. He couldn't do anything else. And that part became a very um, poor man's version of a CGI to have it walk. Yeah. 
Um, so we ha- hired a child that was not as skinny as Mac was. Yeah. Um, this child came in. He must have been about, I don't know, six, five or something, little like that. And he was extremely agile. And the, 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 the mother said, show them what you can do, whatever his name was. And he, he went to the door frame, clung to the two sides of it with the door open and just walk, climb the the door frame. So I said, "Well, he's hired." Wow! So for so for a couple of long shots, we did use him. Also in the film, obviously, we see a lot of branding from McDonald's. We see Ronald McDonald. We see Mac dancing as a teddy bear on the counter. But one of the key features that we keep seeing is Skittles and Coca Cola. Now, was that something you wrote in there to try and? help fund the film or was that something you got asked to do because we see I was just asked to do I was yeah. just, you know I was the hired director and <clears throat> they gave me props to put in the scene as much as I thought there is a bit it was a bit pushy I just went ahead and did it and you know you're going to have commercials in films anyway so I don't know what yeah. the difference is really the problem that you have when you put things into a film that have recognition like a coke or the skittles or anything like that is Nobody else wants to pay to put advertising on that show if it's in that genre of stuff. So you limit your TV market a little bit if you do that. So that's why if I'm making a movie, if I'm producing my own film, I won't put anything featured like that because hopefully one of those elements, a candy merchant or a drink merchant, will actually object to something that's their competition in it the film is one of my favorites and the way it ends frustrates me because obviously the car's driving off we see this cadillac and it says this bubble will be back and you know unless you're making us wait a long time we never saw the sequel (laughs) (laughs) i know that's what that's another thing the the producer wanted and everything the orion film company actually went had some financial problems so that became an issue, and then they didn't. The, it limited the distribution, and then there was a conflict with the money people and the payments from that company. It's all the business people. They have nothing to do with films, but they wreck them anyway. So, was there actually ever a sequel discussed, or was it just left open to kind of hope that there would be? The producer R- R.J. wanted to do one. <laughs> I saw him the other day. People call about that movie a lot you know and the irony is and there's some guy guy on the tv he always makes fun of one scene with the kid flying off the cliff on his wheelchair and everything oh paul rudd yeah yeah he always makes fun of that um but i saw rj recently and somebody had asked me how can we get a copy uh, you know of uh, a copy of the of the actual creature and the thing of the mac character and I said, you know, you should have done toys or something. But he actually has the original Mac and Mac from Mac and Me in a suitcase that he keeps as a personal thing. Wow! But he fell out with hair or had some altercation. So it's amazing, Mark, how many different people, different projects get ruined because of conflicts between individuals. Particularly in America, where people are more play tight than they are in England, as far as not being team players, lots of de- lots of shows suffer because of these ego conflicts. You know. So, in your head, obviously, it's never going to come to light. But can you kind of give me a bit of a, a a summary of what you planned in your head as a sequel? You know, I really didn't go into that. No. I didn't sit down. I think maybe I did in those days, but you're asking me something that took place a long time ago now, Mark. I can't remember. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always thinking of concepts, and I have like five screenplays I'm trying to, trying to get made now, various, various ilk, but, you know, I don't, I, 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 I don't carry those things that long unless I write them down. I hadn't written anything down. And what happened to all the props now? So what happened to the original Mac and the parents and all those puppets? And... Yeah, the, the producer kept them all. And wow. He's, he's got Mac in a suitcase, he told me, in his house. Somebody wanted to buy the Mac and me, but he said, no, I'm not selling it. So he's still, I, I think, dealing with that possibility in his mind. But 
I doubt it'll get it'll get done. And why would you do it with that system anymore when you can do it as a CG, CGI um, production and make it even better and much more much more mobile and much more expressive? I mean, you do it with all the face markers on some on, on a real person to get the expressions you wanted. I'm just imagining now Andy Circus is Mac in Mac and Me Too. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> That's what I want to see. Maybe he'll make one. I see him like once or twice a week at this restaurant where I go to. Yeah. And um, recently, anyway, and uh, he said he's trying to do this and he's trying to do that. But I think that the producer. There's so many people connected to it. Orion has a piece of the concept, and the the the, the original investor has a, a part of the concept. And consequently, how do you get all those people together to agree to give up their rights to get something made? It's, it's very difficult. And if they did come to you and they said, look, you were the man that gave us Mac and Me, would you do Mac and Me too, would you? I would. I mean, I would... I would make it, I had dis- discussed with him having a place where there would be a lot of aliens that have come to this world and you find that they have their own town in a place like that. It's a quite open possibility. It's a go- anything like that's fun, but the thing is, you've got to take that stride into something a little bit more original than what we're seeing now. It's like horror films have all become the same. It's like westerns. You just got fed up with the shootout at the OK Corral. Eventually, you want to move on. So even with these alien films that we have today, you've got to really up the ante unless you make it for a very young audience. It's really for a young audience. Yeah. Cons- consequently, it's sweeter, gentler stuff. So I think if I were going to make it, I would make it for that very young audience. Um, still again with humor in it and some additional colorful characters around him um, but make it for that same audience I I can't make it for I don't think it would work me making something that would entertain you in that in that state anymore you've worked with some of the best people in the business people like Jodie Foster Michael Douglas James Brolin what's been one of your finest moments of working with someone on set I would say that working with Anthony Quinn was my most interesting experience. Yeah. I did I did a film in Mexico with him. So he came to the set after I'd shot everything around him, even the close-ups, basically. So he had like two and a half pages, and I said, this is the scene, Anthony. He said, oh, my God. He said, I haven't learned all that yet, you know. And he said, um, it's, it's too much. And he started going, I said, well, why don't you just have a bash at it and see what you come up with, and then we'll back into it from there. He did the scene. It was just, it was stunningly good. Yeah. I mean, he was just an amazing, amazing actor. He was an incredible artist as well. Something didn't quite work in it, and I'd spent time in Mexico doing films there, and one of the people I'd hired had been my assistant as an animal trainer, and he, he was Anthony Quinn's kind of servant. He was like a general, and this was the guy that d- did all his bid- bidding and everything, and, and he called him Obediente, which was a name I gave him, because in Spanish, El, El Obediente is a, is a name you give to somebody that does everybody, somebody else's shit, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And um, I said to him, when he sa- says to you, ¿Cuántos son? How many Mexicans? How many, uh, Gringos, that were the that was the the group that had had all the other actors in it. Um, are there? They were hiding down beneath a waterfall. The guy, I I said, say son 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 cinco, you know, and um, and then he holds he holds up seven fingers, you know, yeah. and then Billy Quinn looks at him and says, "Ay, qué idiota," <laughs> and hits him. You know what I mean? So you could play tricks on him too, and he would jump into it right away, which I love from actors. If you can get somebody that can invent in the moment or come up with a reaction, um, that's always fun. And then some actors, they don't, they can't get their juices up. So sometimes, if you change the dialogue with the other actor in the scene, 
it startles them, it prompts them, and it gives them the energy they need sometimes. I was reading today about some of the films you'd written in your your you know your your career so far, and mm-hmm. I actually didn't know until today that you actually were involved in Passenger Fifty Seven, which blew my mind. Yeah, I wrote the original script for that. Wow! Um, and and uh, then Warner Brothers bought it. It's a very politically dangerous thing to do. It's almost like today. But in the actual story, the cowboy, he was written for Clint Eastwood originally. I wrote with him in mind. He's on a plane. He gets hijacked to Tehran, and they take everybody off the plane, and they separate them into different cells, you know. And then Clint Eastwood, the character that he was playing, eventually breaks free and gets this gun off this guy, and then he goes on the rampage, and he goes and he takes all the mullahs, the religious leaders, Iran at that time, prisoners, and he says, you bring a bus here and guns and all this stuff, and then he fights his way out of Iran. It was a big, big action-packed thing. It was, it was, it was great, and the head of the studio said to me, he said, well, we can't do this. He said, they'll blow up the theater, so, so we didn't do that. And then we started rewriting it over and over, and I was, a company in Israel wanted to make the movie and I should have just gone ahead and made it with them because it was it was a much better script than we did in the end but in the end I was I'd done like three or four rewrites and then I got another picture so I said I can't do any more so I left on that and then they turned it into a black movie basically with Wesley Snipes which was which is okay but that was only the first third of the movie basically right and they just embellished it in that but it was a fun thing made a lot of money and then, obviously, moving forward now, what, how are you spending your days? What, what you said you got quite a few projects that are in the the. Well, I wrote a couple of novels. I took a couple of years off to deal with aging parents and yeah. dying parents and things on both my wife and my family's side. So I wrote a couple of no- novels at that time when I was distracted and living back east with some trying to help the old folks get through their lives. And uh, uh, one of them is called rage uh, is up on um amazon yeah um it won the one of the best the, the best new writer award and with a big um award place here and everything last year it's a really good book everybody loves it that reads it but it's also about terrorism and it's very political and so i never wrote it into a film because i'd learned my lesson about doing that with passenger 57 yeah i was sitting in a coffee shop writing that story and i was thinking what the hell should i call this thing and i said i should call it passenger i looked at a heinz bottle and i said oh passenger 57 <laughs> nice wow so i wrote that novel and then i wrote another one which is a f- which is a woman's piece you know, about women, strong-willed women having to fight against a, a, a real difficult force of other individuals and that. And they they joined together a little bit like Thelma and Louise. Oh, okay. And so I wrote that book. I haven't even published it yet, and I, but it was, it was very in right now, so I just finished writing that into a mini-series, uh, six episodes, um, to see if I can sell that, and it's called Isabel and Flo. And how's that going yeah. at the moment? Do you, do you think it could well, get picked I up? I'm, I'm just trying to get it out now. I was hoping to get it into Netflix or Amazon. But, you know, these two companies that came, that have now grown up and have so much money and so much influence around the world, they they're, they've become as hard to get into as the studios were before. It's like the gatekeepers of any big company take over in the end, basically. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And unfortunately, that's the way that industry has always gone. So I usually do independent films, my own smaller films. But I'm still still trying to get that off. I have a a young girl's comedy thing called Smooth Operator. Um, It's a caper love story, which I've written a a version that takes place in England and a version that takes place here. Because I've never actually made a film in England, so I wrote this to do there. Yeah. And then I have a big Christmas movie, which is maybe an animated film. I have a movie with Gourmont at the moment, a concept which I'm trying to get them to do about the the Cro-Magnons and the first 
Cro-Magnon makes friends with a wolf that becomes the first dog. And that film is filled with woolly mammoths, woolly rhinos, saber-toothed tigers. Nice. A little bit like Jurassic Park and everything, but it takes place 40,000 years ago. Um, it's really, it's a very realistic piece because it's sort of based upon the paintings of, of Lascaux and the, the cave paintings in France and things like that. You, you're a busy man. I, well, you know, I'm busy waiting for people to read the damn things and have an opinion. And then I just wrote a small series that I'm trying to, to see if I can make myself. It's just, you know, a simple little a little series that I'm trying to do. And then I have a couple of other films that I'm involved with that I've written as well. So I've got a lot going on with scripts and things. If they all do come through and people start wanting them, you're going to be very, very busy and not getting much time to sleep. Oh, well, that would suit me fine. <laughs> I love I love the, the, the actual physicality of making a film. I like to be on the set. I like working with the crew and because uh, I grew up with the crew, so I'm actually just an elevated crew member. And looking back at your whole career, if you retired tomorrow, what's your proudest moment? Oh, boy. You know, I did a silly little musical um, with some kids that a friend of mine was teaching. He was teaching these kids to sing and everything. And I used to go there and I have started recording them singing and videotaping them. And then my wife said, you know, we should make a movie about these kids. It's called Standing Ovation. Okay. And we, we made it basically as, you know, ourselves and taught these kids how to sing and dance. And I really, really enjoyed the effect of music with the visuals of films, and particularly dance numbers. And this particular film had 16 original songs and like 10 dance numbers in it, which I really enjoyed doing. You know, when you edit a scene with actors, even if they're great actors, when you've seen it three times, you've, you've been there, done that. But... What happens when you do a musical and you have great, you know, good songs and you have a reasonably good choreographers or at least charming kids on the screen, you can watch it over and over again because the music adds a life to it that is so important and it's exaggerated in a musical. So I love musicals and I thoroughly enjoyed doing that one. Still playing on Netflix now after seven years. I'll check it out. Well, you can check it out. It's not your cup of tea. You're, t- you're too old, buddy. Hey, hey, I uh, I love La La Land. That was one of my favourite films in the last oh, few I years. Oh, I love that film, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was, I like that one. I liked working with Anthony Quinn in that movie, but the movie, uh, the company, everybody that did that movie died or went bankrupt right away. It never got any expose, and there was never even a great print. Ca- I mean, they had good prints, but we never got one, so it never got put in high quality um video so it didn't help it um but it's still my favorite movie because it was sort of a little bit about something that happened to me when i was young i got hired as a cameraman with a friend of mine to go to spain and interview all these americans that were there for six years and a day for smuggling hashish out of morocco into europe and the united states and the irony was that it turned out that the person that financed the, the documentary was actually a drug dealer who was checking out what was happening. And then he called me and my friend and said, listen, I'm going to do a deal. I'm going to smuggle some hashish out of North Africa, out of Morocco, up to Canada or actually Maine, and I need you guys to sail the boat for me. And we were so broke, we sort of entertained the idea, and we went there and found the boat, and we were in the midst of buying the boat when we got off one of our films, and then we didn't need the money, so we said, piss off, you know? That's fascinating. It was interesting because it was about drug smugglers and everything. Yeah. I spent time in Mexico, and I learned the language a little bit, and it was when the cartels were first beginning or when the drugs were first beginning to flow from South America, and they were coming from Colombia and Mexico, but mainly Colombia, and it was basically marijuana in those days. But uh, I decided to write a story about three out-of-work Americans, like in what the, the, when, there was, when there was a big depression here, and they decided to go down to South America and rip off 
the, 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 the drug people in South America. So it was kind of about what had happened to us in some ways, but transported from, from Spain and Morocco into... Me- we made it in Mexico, but it was supposed to be Colombia. And my final question for you today, and I ask this to every person that comes on the podcast, what advice do you give for filmmakers out there right now trying to make a name for themselves in the business or try and get that first film out there? Well, the hardest thing, there's so much material out there today that you better be unique. You have to do something that stands outside of what we see every day. And the trouble is, is that everybody today is trained or exposed to seven, eight hours of film or TV every day. So everything becomes derivative. It's hard not to be derivative in your material anymore and make and make it about your life or about something that's very peculiar, particular to your life. So, you know, that's the hard thing. And you can't make these big sci-fi movies which give you greater scope, although they're still limited because virtually everything you watch now from Marvel and everything is the same story, just done with better effects. But trying to be unique is the hardest thing, to do something that's a bit shocking or a bit unusual or a ca- and a character that everybody else says, oh, this is great, this is different, this is a new concept, this is something that I want to see. That When I put the ad on TV, people say, oh, oh I want to see that. And so it's not just good enough to write something, it's not just good enough to make a movie, you've got to make a bloody different kind yeah. of movie. And that's the hard part. I've had an absolute blast talking to you today, and I just want to say a massive thank you for taking the time to talk to me. It's been a pleasure. Well, it was my pleasure as well, Mark. It was nice talking with another Midlander. So there it is. There's my interview with Stuart Raphael, the brains behind Mac and Me. What an amazing guest, and it was great to talk all about the film itself, how he got into his career, and what he's done since. And a great, great guest. I'm so glad he had the time to come on this podcast. And again, how exciting is it? We've been waiting since, well, we, I've been waiting since the 80s for hopefully Mac and Me too. And we heard it on this episode. The producer still hasn't given up the hopes of hopefully one day giving us that sequel that we're all crying out for. And when I say all, mostly me. But my God, what a great guy. I'm so thrilled he's come on the podcast and it just made sense to come on Mark and me. So I, I'm, I'm absolutely buzzing as you can probably tell. As always guys, what I do ask is you to try and support the podcast is jump on markandme.com. On there there's my Instagram, my Facebook, my Twitter... You get on there, you can contact me. You can let me know if you've enjoyed today's episode or any of the previous episodes. I read every single tweet, every email, every Facebook comment, every Instagram reply. If you contact me, I'll make sure that I reply back. And it all, all means the absolute world. If you love the podcast and you want to support it, I have got a Patreon page. With all the hosting sites all charging money to have the different episodes on there, and Spotify and iTunes and everything else, it all costs money. So every penny that you invest into Mark and me gets spent on the podcast. I don't take any for myself and it all gets invested in future episodes which you guys all benefit from. And there's always great prizes on there. This month we're giving away one of Tracy's books, loads of Funko Pops, and I'll keep adding more and more as the month goes on. I really hope you've enjoyed today's episode. If you haven't ever seen Mac and Me, go and watch it and then give me abuse and tell me how rubbish it is. But hey, I love it and it means a lot to me and I'm thrilled I've got this episode done. Episode 60 is only a week away and it's a huge, huge guest. One that was on my top five list since I started this podcast and my God, I still can't believe it's happened. I'm absolutely buzzing. If you love 80s films like me, you're going to be in for a treat. So stick around for that. And I'll speak to you all again in a week's time. I paid my dues Time after time I've done my sentence But committed no crime And bad mistakes I've made a few I've had my shoes and kicked in my
taken my bows and my curtain calls. You brought me fame and fortune and everything that goes with it. I thank you all, but it's been no bed of roses.